Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Ryan Warmly. I do social media here at Fantasy Pros. And joining me for today's episode are a couple of terrific guests. First up, it's Fantasy Pros analyst Kyle Yates. Yates, how are all of your teams looking as we head into the final few weeks before the fantasy playoffs? You know what? We're doing okay in some spots. I uh, got some dynasty teams that are looking to make a deep playoff push, and then we just won't even talk about my Scott Fishbowl team. Uh, let's just move right on there. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure we've all got some hits and some misses this season. Also joining us today is one of the fantasy industry's biggest and brightest. It's Yahoo Sports' Matt Harmon. Matt, I'll ask you the same question. How are your teams doing heading into the final month of the season? What's going on, guys? I appreciate you having me. Uh, I've said this on a couple of outlets so far uh, this past week. Like, It's interesting. I feel like every year in fantasy... Um, every league kind of looks the same way standing wise you know like there's one team that's just crushing it right is like you know one they've got like two losses or something like that then there's a couple of goofballs down at the bottom where it's like all right you're you're toast like it's it's been it's been time for you to give up on this thing uh then there's everybody in the middle that's like you know seven and five five and seven something like that which is funny because actually the entire nfl feels like it's in that like middle of the pack so in terms of real yeah. life teams um i always fall in that middle group i seem to know, it's probably because i spread myself too thin um like like kyle i've got some good dynasty teams that are up there in the top of the top of the ring but then like for redraft it's just I, I gotta get out of some of these leagues next year man you guys know how it is too you get invited to so many different things it's like oh this sounds so fun when you're doing all these drafts in august and then like you're, you're trying to manage 20 something teams in the in the middle of the year and you hate your life but yeah that's mostly where my season is uh it's a lot of those like middle ground teams um and trying to make that late playoff push so this will be a very appropriate discussion for me and everyone else who finds themselves in that middle of the pack right now yeah yeah august is the best it's so much fun you're like this is i, I can't believe my luck that i get to be in so many leagues and then right. you get to november and uh it sort of feels the opposite i i will say it is unfortunate that in uh in my se section of the work league that we're in here at fantasy pros it is dan harris who's the 11 and 1 blowing everybody else out of the <laughs> water the how could you uh, let that happen it's, it's really unfortunate um i i, I blame derrick henry uh and cd lamb and mm. darren waller and lamar jackson for all missing time in the last <laughs> few weeks uh my first four picks so that one didn't go so well obviously we've got two of the smartest guys in the business here today so we are set to have a great show just a little housekeeping for those who have been following our trade episodes all season long now that the deadline for trades has passed in most leagues, we are going to shift the focus of these episodes every week. Um, today, we're going to talk about everything from playoffs to dynasty, and most importantly, really, is strategy. Um, that's going to be our focus today as we run through some sort of macro-level macro strategies for December and maybe give you guys a few names of players that can help you execute said strategies. Before we get into it, I do just want to make sure the listeners can find the three of us online. Yates' Twitter handle is at KyleYNFL. Matt is at Matt Harmon underscore BYB, and I can be found at Ryan Warmly. That's warmly like how you dress when it's cold outside. And of course, you can find Fantasy Pros all over the internet at Fantasy Pros. You can also find us on the Fantasy Pros Discord server, which can be found at fantasypros.com slash chat. Anybody can sign up for some good old-fashioned fantasy football chatter, but remember, premium subscribers gain access to dozens of extra channels, including AMAs with analysts like Joey P, Dan, and of course, Yates. You can also get advice from fellow fanatics, and we even have extra channels for other non-sports topics. We're also still going strong on the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash fantasy pros. We've got so much more content there on top of all of our podcasts, including quick-hitting advice videos, live streams throughout the week, uh, so be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all of our latest videos. Fellas, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's jump into Monday Night Football. Uh, a boring game in terms of like final score and just these primetime games. We, we've had a couple nice ones lately, but also uh, more duds than we would have liked. But some interesting fantasy takeaways. I'll start on the Seahawks side and just the man who makes everything move there, Russell Wilson, 20 of 31, 247 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. He led the Seahawks with 16 rushing yards on two attempts. <laughs> Yates, did you see anything in this Jeez. game that gives you more confidence in, in Wilson going forward or less confidence, or is this sort of a nothing game? It's funny because I will sit down and I'll watch the game on Monday night and then but I won't really like pay attention to a ton of the stats as they're happening and then I get to on Tuesday morning I'll wake up and I'll check all my fantasy lineups and stuff like that and see how the matchups went and you look at Russell Wilson's fantasy finish and you're like in the fantasy point total and you're like 
that is drastically different than what I thought I saw on the field, right? He saved a, his fantasy day with that late touchdown to Freddie Swain, but man, this uh, this offense just looks broken right now. I mean, DK Metcalf barely doing anything, barely getting him involved. It is Russ is uh, Russ is barely like in the kitchen, let alone cooking. So I think we we need to figure out what is going on here in Seattle, but. Russ, people are just going to look at this box score. They're going to say, and the fantasy points are going to say, like, man, he did pretty well. No, he didn't. This this offense did not look good last night. Matt, what's your confidence level on Russ going forward? Uh, not. I mean, like <laughs> Kyle says, from a fantasy angle, it's it's still all right. I still think, like, when you're ranking quarterbacks the rest of the season, I still think you've got to have him around that 12-ish range uh, because, like, who are you really real? – are you taking Kirk Cousins? Are you taking Cam Newton over Russell Wilson? I mean, maybe, but I, you can you can have those discussions with yourself. I still think that Russ is <laughs> probably a relatively decent – but relatively decent uh, streaming quarterback like kind of level there. I think you're probably starting him every single week still going forward. But just to note on Kyle's point here, this is the drive recap for uh, the Seattle Seahawks. First quarter, they have two drives, one, three plays, punt, one, six play, touchdown. Uh, then in the next quarter, four plays, punt, two plays, fumble, three plays, punt, four plays, fumble. There in the third quarter, uh, three plays, punt, three plays, punt, three plays, punt, five plays, <laughs> punt, ten plays, touchdown. That was their. That's their drive recap. Even that the is, punter on Lord. the Seahawks is like, guys, this is a little excessive. Yeah, no, he, he's like, I'm, enough of this already. I'm tired of going out there. Yeah, it was an unbelievably rough watch. I think the, as Kyle said it perfectly, the fantasy finish does not tell you the story of what went on in this offense. It was brutal to watch. And I think, honestly, we can just be honest with ourselves, I think. Like, you know, a couple of uh, my folks were talking in, in my Discord channel today, and it was like, what's up with DK Metcalf? Like, what's up? It's like, this. I, I think there are some questions to ask you know about the individual players here but for the most part let's just be honest with ourselves the last year and a half Russell Wilson's not played well I mean he did not play well to end 2020 I don't think he's played all that well to start this season or then obviously coming back off of this injury those 19 hour a day rehab sessions did not do him very well it looks like or maybe came back too soon like Russ get some sleep buddy I mean it, it, that might help you out a little too so yeah I think it is it's tough in Seattle right now my confidence level in him you know, supporting these guys like a, uh, you know, Tyler Lockett, who obviously has the bigger game here. I think that that's great. I, I thought it was interesting that the broadcast highlighted like, you know, Russ passing up these middle of the field uh, lanes in terms of, and, and then trying to force things outside of DK Mech. I'm like, yeah, that kind of sounds like Russell Wilson, his entire career. They've never been a matriculate the offense down the field. Uh, I think the more interesting question for Russ is like, what's next you know for for the rest of obviously the rest of the season i think you can still play russ in fantasy but what comes next for russell wilson's career uh, right. either in seattle or otherwise well it's interesting because this sort of and i'm not the first person to make this point it feels like a bit of an end of an era in seattle yes. obviously there was all the rumors in the off season about russ maybe wanting to leave now they have this really bad year um it, it, they look like a team that everybody wishes they had like two or three more bye weeks like they're just a team that seems checked <laughs> out like not particularly interested in playing out the rest of the season so i do wonder if we could see the offense not just continue to struggle but but completely crater just a couple notes yeah. on some of these players like lockett did have three catches 96 yards as you mentioned metcalf just one catch 13 yards he hasn't scored a touchdown since week eight and he hasn't topped 50 yards since week seven so i'm not sure what your level of panic would be on these guys when you look at their talent and and their track record but um it just it just hasn't been pretty as of late <clears throat> but uh, i do want to ask on alex collins excuse me <clears throat> Yates, um, 14 yards. I said he didn't even uh, top Russell Wilson, 16 <laughs> yards rushing, 14 on seven rushes, one catch for 13 yards. Do you see yourself starting Collins at any point the rest of the season? I really don't think that we can. And we had been viewing Collins as this guy who was like, well, he's going to get volume and he's in a fine offense. So if he falls into the end zone, great. But you kind of view him as a low end RB2. No, it's not the case anymore because we just talked about this offense really isn't doing a ton. Matt saying the punt, punt, punt. Like that's that's because Alex Collins isn't doing a ton on first and second down where they're trying to run the ball. He's He's running into the back of offensive linemen. So I just don't think that at this point we can go anywhere near Alex Collins. I think he is one of these guys that unless you are absolutely, absolutely desperate, you can drop him in your league. And that sounds crazy to say for a starting running back for an NFL team, but Collins is just not getting it done. Yeah, there was some excitement out there once Chris Carson was like officially announced as out for the season, but 
Um, yeah, I don't see any reason to be excited or, or to even roster him at this point. Uh, the last Seahawk I just want to touch on is Gerald Everett because going into the year, he was somebody that I thought could be like a nice tight end sleeper, potential breakout candidate being the, the main tight end in a Russell Wilson offense. Um, not He had nine targets last night, which did lead the team, just five catches, 37 yards, and he did have a touchdown. He was also blocked from jumping into the stands as he tried to, <laughs> to do that on the road, which I thought was pretty funny to see, pretty emblematic of their night offensively. But um, do you guys, uh, Matt, I'll start with you, think that Everett can be a startable tight end rest of the season, or are you just staying away? I'd rather not be involved in this offense at all, uh, outside of obviously being forced into the Metcalf and Lockett business based on the rest of your roster. Uh, so I'd probably pass. But look, if you've been you know, starting Tyler Higbee and it's not really working out for you, you know, if you're not one of those folks that hit on the Dawson Knox or Dalton Schultz like waiver wire run and you're still kind of picking between players every single week or you know maybe you were you thought you got lucky with Dan Arnold and then the last two weeks has not been so great obviously maybe you look at a Gerald Everett so it really depends on your team I'd rather not be but yeah sure I think he is a guy that you can consider uh, as a flyer streaming tight end the rest of the way it's just really tough to imagine this offense hitting a ceiling where he's going to continue to score touchdowns like this one offense that has done, I guess, sort of better in the last couple of weeks is the Washington football team. I, I sort of buried the lead, not talking about Antonio Gibson right off the bat. 29 rushes, 111 yards, also seven catches and 35 yards. Um, that's more than twice as, any, as many receptions as he has had in a game all season long. It's also his first time topping 100 rushing yards in a game this season. Just an absolutely ridiculous workload for this day and age, really for any era of football. That's just yeah. so many touches, and it continues a pattern um, in the last three weeks. He's had 24 rushing attempts, then 19, now 29. Those, of course, have coincided with three wins. So I guess my question is, and, and, and Matt, I'll start with you on this one. Do you think that the Washington football team as a team is going to be in enough games down the stretch where Gibson will continue to get this kind of workload? Shoot, buddy. This is the Antonio <laughs> Gibson I thought I was drafting in August. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think they're – obviously you can point it back to the bye week. You know, listen, I do not think at any point – and maybe this actually gives you optimism for Antonio Gibson in 2022 and beyond. I don't think he'll be like anywhere close to 100% the rest of the season. You know, even in he's still been on the injury report with the shin thing the last couple of weeks. Um, he limped off a little bit in this game. There's a couple of times when he even looked like he was like, Whew. like me and yeah. me and uh, the Seahawks punter. We're we're getting a lot of work here <laughs> right. in this game. Both of our <laughs> legs are getting pretty tired. But um, yeah, I think you could point back to the bye week, and uh, they talked about this as well in the broadcast too that. You know, the Washington football team, they didn't just look at it as like, okay, Antonio Gibson's getting healthy, but also like we need to sort of start establishing the run and, and, and getting back to that level of football. Also, their offensive line has gotten a little bit healthier. I know they had another injury to a center last night, uh, but, you know, Brandon Sheriff is back in the lineup. A couple other plays have been, a couple other players have been back for them as well. So there are, are several factors you can point to and say, okay, this makes sense why they've gotten back on track here with Gibson. I think he's still a very good player. I think he looks good out there, and the usage has just been great. I, I do think, um, Ryan, that he will be – that he'll be involved because they will be in enough games. You know, their schedule is not bad down the stretch. They're still in a place at 5-6 and six where they can tell themselves a story that they're competing for a playoff spot. I think Heineke has gotten better, too, the last few weeks. And, uh, listen, I'm a Taylor Heineke guy, the pride of Old Dominion there, uh, Taylor Heineke. So, yeah, I, I think that he is – looking good the offense is looking good and also this entire offensive ecosystem is getting healthier too i think that really matters you know curtis samuel finally making plays for this team logan thomas back almost caught a touchdown uh last night as well so there's a lot to be excited about for washington's offense i think all of that bleeds back into antonio gibson a guy that you know i've been in terms of rest of season rankings on receptionperception.com been like up and down up and down all season i think we got to start bumping him back up again based on the usage of the last three weeks yeah, Yates, how high would you put Gibson ceiling rest of the season? Would, would he be an RB1 for you? I mean, just considering the landscape. We, we keep seeing our running backs dropping right. like flies right and left. So right. would he get that high for you? I think even if we had Chris McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, like even if we had those guys healthy for the rest of the year, Gibson would be in that territory. Now, when I called out Gibson as a buy low option in week eight, or like going into their bye week, I did not anticipate this. Like I did not anticipate that he would come out and have this type of workload. And even I put this out on Twitter last night. I was like, is Washington actually willingly targeting Antonio Gibson in the passing game? Like they were doing it on screens on first and second down. Like they were getting him the ball as a receiver. And every fantasy manager is out there like, 
hello, this is what we've been telling you to do for the last two years. Like, get him the ball. And it's it's happening. So, yeah, I think at this point we got to lock in Gibson into that top 12 territory the rest of the season because of the workload that he's getting. And we know that he's always had the talent. Now, he didn't find the end zone here this week. Those both went to J.D. McKissick. But also we got to talk about McKissick might miss some time here with that injury, that scary injury at the end of the mm -hmm. game. I haven't seen any updates on that either. So that's something to monitor, too. If that is the case, then we're looking at an even larger workload for Antonio Gibson. Yeah, it's a great point on the injury. I haven't seen any updates either myself, but if there is any time missed there, then yeah, Gibson just even further solidifies because they, they have preferred to throw to McKissick, obviously, over the years um, when they've both been in Washington. Um, so having him out of the picture would be very good for Gibson. And then just lastly on Washington, before we move on, you know, Terry McLaurin, four catches for 51 yards. It's not like you're going to be sitting him or, or giving up on him or anything. He's obviously way too talented of a guy to do that, but just sort of where where are your vibes on McLaurin, I guess? Matt, I'll start with you again. As we enter December, would you call yourself more pessimistic or optimistic on how you think McLaurin will finish the season from a fantasy perspective? I would still be optimistic. I mean, the volume has mostly been there all season. Like I mentioned, though, they are getting some guys back, which you could kind of tell yourself a story that it's good or bad for uh, Terry McLaurin. Obviously, like I think people will look at the correlation of, Oh, McLaurin has this down game in a pretty good spot against Seattle uh, while Antonio Gibson is running the ball really well. While Logan Thomas is back out there, Curtis Samuel's not like fully involved in terms of playing a ton of snaps. You know, thank God they're not like trying to rush him back once again, I guess. Um, so that's that's still like, you know, you could tell yourself that that's not a good thing for McLaurin. But I think this offense just getting more guys out there is probably a good thing for the entire unit. I mean, guys, like we're a couple of weeks ago, we're looking at like Taylor, High, like Terry McLaurin and the, the preseason boys out there, you know, like right. these guys who are taking snaps for Washington is like unbelievable. Even after like Ricky Seals Jones, like we were interested in him for a while, then he gets hurt, you know? So I think all of these guys getting back there sort of gets Washington back to our preseason expectations. I was very high on this offense going into the year and the schedule is pretty good down the stretch. They get the Raiders this week, they get the Cowboys twice, they get the Eagles twice, um, and then obviously the Giants in the final week of the season. So th that's not a bad schedule, I think, for Washington. There's a lot of gettable spots there. I'd still be pretty optimistic about Terry McLaurin. Yates, would you say, if you had to pick one, do you think it's more likely that Logan Thomas finishes the season as a tight end one from now till, till the end of December, or McLaurin as a wide receiver one from now to mm. the end of December? I will question. probably say Logan Thomas there just because it's going to be easier for Logan Thomas to do that, right? He sees so much target volume in that offense. And even if they see around the same, like it's just the competition for the wide receiver one spots versus the tight end one spot. All you got to do is catch like four passes and you're a tight end one on the week. So, uh, yeah, I think Logan Thomas, I, I said this, you know, we had some concern or questions about him coming into the Monday night matchup, you know, but when Logan Thomas is healthy, you're playing him as a top 15 option. And then after what we saw this last night, we saw that he was going to be on a snap count. That was what was kind of talked about. That really was not the case. And he nearly had that touchdown at the end of the game, too. So I'm plugging Logan Thomas back into my lineup every single week as a top 10 option. So what I want to do here as we get into sort of the rest of season strategy is ask a few questions. And then as we talk it out, we can also give some player examples that come to mind. So Yates, what I want to start with is I think the single most important question for the final month of the season what is your overarching December strategy for kickers? <laughs> yeah, let me give a let me give a ten thousand word essay on uh, my strategy for kickers. No, man, I got I got nothing for you. <laughs> of course, the first thing I actually want to ask you guys about is actually your benches. Obviously, it's important to have depth as we navigate bye weeks and injuries throughout the regular season. But as we get into and near the playoffs, the focus shifts, uh, you know, towards having strong starters. So, Yates, what is your general approach to filling your bench spots in December? Yeah, we talked about this on the Waiver Wire podcast yesterday, saying that, like, with guys like Jamal Williams being out there on Waiver Wires right now, like, he could have immediate value with DeAndre Swift kind of banged up, and they might just shut DeAndre Swift down. And Jamal Williams at that point would then, would then, of course, become a valuable fantasy asset. But regardless, he needs to be picked up because of his high-end insurance policy that he has throughout the fantasy playoffs. The last thing that we really want to be doing is in week 15, 16, or 17, battling for these guys who are going to become top 20 plays, especially at the running back position. These guys that could help us win fantasy matchups, battling for those guys on the waiver wire with the player that we're competing against, right? When it gets down to those four teams and you're suddenly now saying, okay, I've got Jamal Williams is sitting out there on the waiver wire. Something happens to DeAndre Swift, God forbid. And then now we got to play DeAndre or uh, Jamal Williams in a plus matchup. Well, then at that point, I don't want my opponent to get him. So being able to take the bench spots that you have 
the players that really are not going to help you push your way over the top, right? The players that really are just there to be bench fillers, guys like, you know, Brian Edwards. And, you know, if you're still holding on to someone like Brian Edwards, like at that point, just cut him, move on. Jamison Crowder, cut him, move on. These guys are not going to help you win fantasy titles. But the players who do have the high-end insurance policy, the players that we want to get ahead of, on the waiver wire in case something were to happen to the starter above them or their situation changes. Those are the players that I am now pivoting to to bring onto my roster here in the next couple of weeks as we get ready for deep playoff pushes. Matt, what about you? What's sort of your overarching December strategy in regards to your bench? Yeah, I think Kyle hit it on the head there. That's the biggest thing uh, that I've always advocated for is like being ultra aggressive in stashing these backup running backs. Uh, you know, even like more drastic example, you know, what about a guy like Marlon Mack who has no, you know, standalone value? Right. Obviously, Jamal Williams is sort of in that like flex with benefits area. Shout out to Mike Wright, uh, fantasy footballers <laughs> I saw was the first one to say that. So I always flex like to give him benefits. credit. That, that's great stuff there. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously like Tony Pollard, previously James Conner and AJ Dillon were those guys that you could start as your RB2 or flex if you needed it. But now they've sort of inherited that big workload, uh, the, the latter two guys, Conner and Dillon. And, you know, that's that's the benefit, right? Like they were the flexes and now they're the benefits. See, it's just great stuff there. Um, <laughs> you know, for, for a guy like Marlon Mack or even a Samaje Pirine or Ronald Jones, like – these guys aren't you. If you're starting them, you're in trouble, and I'm surprised right. you're in a you're, you're you're in a you're in a spot where you're competing in December here. But um, they you want those guys on your benches, like Kyle said, because again, knock on wood, God forbid, like we're not trying to say that like Jonathan Taylor is going to get hurt or Joe Mixon is going to get hurt or Leonard Fournette is going to get hurt because. We don't want that, but look at what happens with running backs. Look at the situation right now. I mean, the top 10 guys drafted this past year, it's like an utter and complete landmine. And even if JT, like, misses a couple games in December, Joe Mixon misses a couple games in December, like Kyle said, you don't want to be the one out there who's battling with your entire league to try to, to you know, wrestle some Aj P. Ryan off the waiver wire. You want everybody to be clicking, you know, Tuesday morning, like, all right, let me go pick up P. Ryan. Oh, damn. This guy's – somebody's already got him on the bench. Mm -hmm. Like, I think – and you could be – like – Obviously, like James McCrowder, Brian Edwards, yeah, those are easy cuts. But like, I had somebody ask me about like Kadarius Tony the other day. I'm like, if well, if, listen, he's probably you don't want to, you you don't want to like have uh, a guy out there that's going to help your league mate win that title, right? Like, don't be too aggressive. But like, if a guy like Kadarius Tony is your wide receiver five or something like that, you're never going to start him. Um, I would be okay making that move, like because he's probably not a player that you're you're ever gonna you're ever gonna play going forward. I don't think he is gonna be like the difference maker for your league mate to end up beating you. Um, maybe there's a chance that happens, but I think it's pretty slim. So I, I would be ultra aggressive in doing stuff like that. Well, I think Tony's an interesting example because he's one of the guys that you could make a case for as high upside, who's not high upside because of a potential role change. Well, I guess you could say it's sort of his role change, but not in terms of like an injury on the death chart in front of him. Whereas a lot of the guys that we mentioned are like the Alexander Madisons of the world, the Chuba Hubbards, just guys that are now getting more value in the last couple of days because of injuries. But the guys like that, the backup running backs, as you mentioned, Matt, that they, they can really be league winners. But there are also players out there who do have some high upside if the team starts using them more or they sort of develop. A lot of these rookies, you know, we've seen in recent years, have taken leaps in the second half of the season. This season, somebody like Elijah Moore was pretty worthless in terms of, of start ability early in the season and now in the last month has been like a top five fantasy receiver. So are there any guys like that, and, and Yates, I'll start with you, that stick out as maybe not because of a potential injury, but just because of a, temp, a potential change or development could be high upside? So I don't know if there really is any of those those players that immediately jump to mind. And Matt, maybe you can chime in when, um, when we turn it to you. But like for me, it the thought process becomes, okay, we're now in week 13. What am I going to see from those players in the next week, maybe two, that's going to give me confidence to play them in my fantasy football playoffs? Because this is part of the rankings process. It's not just like the guys that we think are going to have good weeks, but also like banking into our confidence that they're going to have that good week. And so you got to kind of find that balance from a rankings perspective. So with Kadarius Tony as a perfect example, it's like, over the next two weeks, what am I going to see from Kadarius Tony with maybe Sterling Shepard coming back into the lineup, Kenny Galladay with the offensive coordinator shift, like Daniel Jones being his quarterback? Like, what am I going to see from Kadarius Tony this week if he plays or next that then I'm going to feel super confident playing him in week 15 in my fantasy football playoff matchup? That is kind of the thing that 
I don't know if there's going to be any of those players that I see over the next two weeks that are going to lock themselves into my starting lineup. You know, you mentioned Kadarius Tony as like your wide receiver five, like those kind of guys where you know that you're not going to have that confidence in playing them come two weeks down the road. And a lot can change in two weeks, obviously. But at the same time, especially at the wide receiver position, I really don't think that we see things shift that much where then we feel super confident playing them in those key, key matchups. So that's that's the thing that, as you say that, as you were talking, I was like, that's what I'm thinking about. I don't know if there really are any of those players at the wide receiver position specifically. Matt, does anybody come to mind for you? I think it might be, and these are not like waiver wire guys like Elijah Moore was or something, but maybe, you know, currently injured players if you wanted to kind of, um, again, trade deadlines are, are like, fast approaching or come and gone so it's kind of tough to say like oh i'd go trade for an aj brown or a julio jones or something like that but if i don't think anybody's dropping aj brown but if somebody drops like a julio jones or something like that because they're they're wide receiver five i mean can how confident can you really be uh when and if he comes back or like a curtis samuel type you know i would say do it for you could play this game with like proven good players but like guys you know that are going to be coming out of nowhere um, and I would even put like as a, a Kadarius Tony, not in that like proven good player. Uh, I think mm-hmm. he's explosive and like he's got a lot of juice, but there's a lot of questions there as well. But like a guy, just using like Julio Jones or Curtis Samuel for example, like these guys who are going to moonwalk right into starting jobs as soon as they're ready to roll. I think you could maybe bench stash those type of players. Um, but yeah, it's pretty tough with a with a guy like uh, Tony's a perfect example. I think to continue to come back to, it's like sure you could keep him on your bench, you could stash him. Like he has a great week fourteen or something. They're all the same questions would apply. Like ne- right. the, the next week, like. Are they really going to continue to creatively design things for him? The target distribution there in New York is tight. So I, I think the the message here for that is always be thinking like two or three weeks ahead of time. Uh, for a guy like a, like a Julio Jones or something like that, like if he does for whatever reason come back and, and then like the Titans have a pretty decent matchup in you know, week 15, 16, 17, I think that's like a good thing you could tell yourself. Be thinking ahead of time there as opposed to just living in the, the current moment. So quickly before we move on from the benches, I do just want to ask, so th- there's there's the high upside guys that obviously we're very interested in stashing. There's sort of the low upside matchup plays that we're not really as interested in right now. There's also ensuring your own starters with handcuffs. So th- there's there's not really upside there because if one of your starters goes down, then you're just you know replacing him with a one-for-one one or often not even as good as a one-for-one one replacement. But do you guys think that that is just as valuable or more valuable than the high upside guys that aren't on your team? Would you rather have somebody else's handcuff or your own? And, and Gates, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, I think it depends on the situation because different insurance running backs are ranked differently, right? Like we look at the uh, Samaj P. Ryan, like we know that Samaj P. Ryan is not going to come in and do what Joe Mixon is currently doing. Like he's not going to perform to the same level, but yet if Leonard Fournette goes down, then Ronald Jones can be plugged in because the offense is so explosive. Like he can be plugged in and he can score touchdowns. So mm-hmm. I think that's something where you got to kind of just parse through and say like, okay, what's the difference here with my starters versus the, the players that could potentially change. I think there's, there is value at least in hand, it, handcuffing or having the insurance running backs for your players just so that way you ensure like i've got someone that i can play that um and kind of i think finding the balance too where if you have let's just say you have joe mixon and leonard fournette that's a realistic scenario where you know you have the the balance here where you make sure that you've at least got one of those guys one of those backups and then maybe you're taking a shot on a marlon mack as that other insurance running back kind of balancing it out so at least you have the player that could be dropped in in case something happens to your starter but yet you also have that high end insurance policy where you've got the starter for someone else if that player goes down matt yeah sort of what's your backup running back situation already look like i mean i can't imagine there's two with the running back landscape there's too many people out there like oh yeah i'm just like stocked i'm four or five right. deep at running back right but let's say in a hypothetical world you feel pretty good about you've got Leonard Fournette and Elijah Mitchell uh, and maybe like a Daryl Henderson type like okay if I lose Leonard Fournette like maybe I can just turn back to Daryl Henderson as opposed to like I think you're gonna weigh like Henderson versus Ronald Jones like you'll you'll naturally weigh that sort of discussion there so that's part of it I also think too though you know this is we put a feature on uh, receptionperception.com about uh, the running back stash rankings because I talk about this all the time every single year I was like maybe you should put something on the website where like I'd prefer this guy over this guy like this guy should be 100% rostered here all already in week 10 uh then this guy's like a priority stash type of level like we've seen guys you know 
Alexander Madison is obviously the consummate example. Like he should have been probably drafted and held onto all season because you know, right. like Kyle said, the clarity of it is is almost more valuable than the actual replacement asset, right? Like you know, the second uh, Dalvin Cook gets hurt, freaking Alexander Madison is going to get plugged in there. The guy's averaged like over twenty carries and seven and a half targets uh, in the two games that Dalvin Cook has missed so far this year. Like that immediate plug and play ability from Madison Madison makes him a uniquely valuable stash. I think a Sony Michelle is in that same range too. Like I think he should be a hundred percent rostered, um, whether you have Daryl Henderson or not. Then I think, yeah, it kind of comes back to who, 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 if you have Jonathan Taylor, maybe it does make sense if you're not confident with your backup running back situation to stash a Marlon Mack. But you also know that Marlon Mack would, would not be getting like 100% of the backfield touches like a Michelle right. or Madison yep. would. He'd be splitting with Naheem Hines there. So it really does depend like player to player. And that's why I think it's important to kind of put these guys in buckets, put these guys in tiers, and then you can sort of decide like, what is your running back situation? And um, obviously, like in an ideal scenario, I think from like from weeks ten because I start thinking about this stuff like several weeks ago. I think it start like from week ten to week thirteen or something. That's when I'd love to be stashing. Um, if I'm you know if I've got Zeke, I'd love to stash Alexander Madison. I'm, again, I think he should be more highly rostered than that. But just as a hypothetical, then maybe from week like fifteen, sixteen, and, and, and so on. Maybe then, like, I'd love to have my own guy just in case. Because, like, I don't care about what happens. The season's over soon enough. Like, I, I, if, like, I get banged with the Zeke injury, I want my guy behind me, basically, is how I'd look at it. Looking even further ahead into the future, would you guys ever consider proactively picking up bench players on a really good NFL team in the hopes that they might bench their starters late in the season? And that actually might not as apply as much this year since there doesn't appear to be like that one juggernaut team that you know would be good enough to do it in a week 17 when we're assuming most fantasy leagues have their championship. But is it something that you would look at, Matt? I think that's pretty aggressive. Um, that There's a lot of projection there. Like you said, who are going to be those teams right now? Like Arizona? Are you picking yeah. up, um, you know, Rondale Moore, I guess, for that reason only? I, I don't know. I think that is uh, – that's pretty aggressive. It, it, there's just a, it's the lack of clarity, especially in a year like this. We also just don't know when are, t- are teams only going to do that in week 18, or are they going to do that in week 17 right. this year? Because it's a new it's a new season. We don't know that. We don't know who those teams are. Um, and even then, it's like all right, like Kyle said, if you've got a, if you've got a good enough roster that you made it to, to week eight week 17, your championship, are you really plugging those players out for like Gabe Davis or something? I mean, I hope not. Let's just put it that way. Well, for, for the record, I am starting Gabriel Davis in my dynasty <laughs> league right now. It's not pretty. Uh, and, and, hey, I've been no, starting like uh, we, Russell yeah. Gage and KJ Osborne. So I, I, I mean, that's yeah, where I, I'm I at. I will not yeah. be making we, it to we, week hey, seventeen. Kyle was talking about <laughs> Alex. Kyle was talking about Alex Collins. I've got a dynasty team that I think is nine and three right now, and I was like. And now with CMC going out, I'm like, I really wish I could count on <laughs> Alex Collins the rest of the season. So you got to do some, you got to do some gross stuff in Dynasty sometimes. It is what yeah. it is. I, I, obviously things change so fast in the NFL week to week, even in a normal season, and, and let alone this year. Uh, Matt, one of your coworkers at Yahoo, Scott Pianowski, always likes to say it's a snow globe league. Um, where every yeah. single week it's, it's you shake up the snow globe and who knows where everything's going to fall down. So it's, it's really hard to look too far ahead at schedules and matchups. I mean, Yates, would you ever take a chance on something like this with picking up a backup? Matt's correct, where it's like this is so far out for us to be able to. And again, we're not saying like pick this guy up now, but like I think – we just don't have that clarity, especially in this first year where we just don't know what NFL teams are going to do. There's a lot of projecting there with that situation for us to be able to feel comfortable making that type of decision. And again, like, how are you going to feel when you have to roll that guy out in your championship week? I just don't know. There's a lot there that we just don't know yet. I don't think that I feel comfortable doing that. How far ahead, Matt, do you look at schedules in general? I know you start. You talked about like a couple of weeks ago, you're thinking about picking up backups and potential handcuffs. Are you at that point in the season, or at least by now, looking at schedules and saying, I'm going to pick up this guy because he has a very friendly fantasy finish? Or are you still saying, that's too far away, I'm not going to try and play that guessing game? No, I think that game is worth playing when you're kind of – it depends on that. Like, if you're that Arizona Cardinals-level team that, like, oh, I actually have the best record here. Like, I can start looking forward, you know. Um, I think you could do that even a couple weeks ago. You could start maybe consider, especially as, like, you could still make trades and stuff like that. You could you could have done that. I think now is an appropriate time to do it. And um, But, you know, it's, it's still – 
I still prefer to be week by week, right? Like, I mean, again, who are we? It, it's all about who are you adding, right? Uh, maybe you can look at that for, again, some of these proven players. But, again, I think your bench should be mostly stocked with uh, upside flyers right now. Like, I don't really know what the point of adding potential depth is. But, yeah, if those upside flyers have, like, good schedules, maybe if you are if you are trying to decide that uh, tiebreaker between a Ronald Jones or a Marlon Mack, these guys are getting mentioned on a fantasy show more than they, uh, more than they have all year. Uh, <laughs> I think you could maybe break ties in favor of schedule and stuff like that. Sure. I think you could use it as a tiebreaker, basically. We are Marlon Mack's favorite fantasy podcast. <laughs> y- Yates, what, what is this, 2017? <laughs> right, right. Uh, I think, and Matt touched on it. It's like, it all depends on where you're at as far as your fantasy season. If you are sitting there and you're nine and three, you've got a very solid record. You've locked up one of the top two spots, three spots or whatever. You look like you're going to be in the playoffs for sure. Then yes, I am dropping those guys that I talked about earlier, the Jamison Crowders, the guys that really are not making much of an impact where I am then adding these high end insurance policy guys. But if I'm sitting there and I just need to put string together wins, I can't afford to take those shots on the guys for the high-end insurance policy, guys. I need players that are going to be able to contribute and help me right away, which is why our waiver wire show from this past week was super, or yesterday, was super interesting because we had varying levels of, like, normally we're pretty much in the same ballpark. And then I was listening to the kickoff podcast that Dan Harris does, and his rankings were completely different than what I had because he's taken a different approach at this time of the year, whereas I was going, like, there are still some teams that need to string together some wins. So you might want to pick up Deshaun Jackson. <laughs> like that's yeah. just kind of where we're at because he might pop off, you know, a long play as a flex option for you next week. So I think it all depends on where you're at. Are you below 500? Are you trying to get into that last playoff spot? Then you can't afford to take those, those shots on the high end insurance policy guys. You need to be able to add guys that are helping you now. Whereas if you're sitting in first, second place, then you can add those guys. This next rest of season strategy question is maybe a little less strategy and a little more ethical, moral. Uh, But Matt, would you ever consider throwing a matchup late in the season to get a more favorable opponent in the playoffs or keep a tough team out of the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me just say for the record, I uh, defer to all fantasy ethical and legal matters to Judge Andy Barons (laughs) in the fantasy court on Fantasy Football Live every Sunday morning. So I do not speak for Andy in this situation. Uh, Please, uh, you know, you can go to him for all of these uh, ethical situations. I I, No, I don't think I would. I mean, I'm trying to win. You know, I don't even like doing the whole... uh, you know, okay, I'm going into Monday night last week, and uh, you know, I've just got Chris Godwin left to play against the Giants, and you know, I'm I, I'm got a two point lead. What if he gets negative two points? You're like, I mean, I don't want to manifest that negative energy. I'm playing Chris Godwin and all that stuff. So yeah, I tend to no, I don't think I would do that. Yeah, I think like the uh, proliferation of stat corrections, I feel like they've happened more and more in recent years, would make me scared right. to do that that sitting thing. Because I'm like, <laughs> what if I, that's just bad karma. Yeah. If I sit him, then a stat correction comes and I'm losing, like, that's on me. Uh, you'll never forgive you. yourself. You'll never forgive no, yourself never, for ever, that. Ever. So do, do, <laughs> do uh, this is anything like with that type of stuff, I'm like, do what you can live with, man. Because the last thing you want to do is be sitting there um, Tuesday morning, that stat correction hits and you just feel like a complete idiot. So yeah, I think. Um, don't operate in arrogance either. That's another thing too. It's like, oh, I'll wrap up. This. Like, I'd rather play this this guy in week sixteen than this this person. Uh, hey, that that team might very well be the one that ends right. up whooping you at the end of the yep. year. So be careful yeah, has, with that. Has that ever actually worked out for anybody? No, it feels like it just <laughs> always is going to backfire. It's a galaxy it's- brain thing to do. It's a galaxy <laughs> yes. brain thing to do, and like <laughs> that does not always go so well. Yates, what about you? Uh, I have been known to partake in this particular uh, <laughs> strategy before, and it uh, is not necessarily one that I would recommend. Uh, let me be clear. <laughs> have I done it? Yes. Would I do it again? No. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is something where, just like Matt said, you're, you're playing to win. You don't know what those matchups are going to look like. Key injuries could happen in week, you know, in week 15, and then week 16 you're playing this opponent. You're thinking that you're going to play them. Things like that. Like, no, you don't really think about that a whole lot. You play to win and then let everything else figure itself out. Well, Yates, I know you and Matt both play in a lot of Dynasty Leagues, as we've talked about on the show. So how do you approach like tanking? Or I guess there's not really a better word for it, rebuilding. Um, is it ever okay to throw a matchup to get a better draft pick in a Dynasty League? Yeah, so this is a little bit different with with Dynasty as far as like better draft picks, right? And I think that there is a, a clear line between like sitting and, or like not playing submitting a full lineup like that is just you should never do that under any circumstance like field a lineup always now it doesn't matter who you're putting in there necessarily i can't really help 
uh, and dictate that. But as far as like, do not just leave your roster empty or anything like that to be able to get that better matchup. But this is why I always condone um, and, and suggest like league dues, right? Because for me as a commissioner of a dynasty league, if I've got someone who bought in, they did their 25, 50, whatever. And I know a lot of listeners play for a lot more than that, but putting in that league due, I don't really care what you do with a dynasty league after that. It's where it's the free leagues where someone could just completely check out all year and there's like no consequence, right? There's nothing that they lost in this situation. Or if there is that like last place punishment, something like that for a dynasty league, then that is where I really don't care what you do as the dynasty commissioner, because I know that there's a punishment and that you're aware of it. But if there it's the situations where there's not a league due or any or no last place punishment where it's like what can i do as the dynasty commissioner to prevent you from tanking or you know but as long as you're fielding full lineups i i, I can't really do anything as the dynasty commissioner in my opinion matt do you condone tanking no uh <laughs> compete baby compete to the end no i mean listen i think kyle's right you, leaving a blank lineup is like beyond the pale that's you know then then you're you're really crossing that uh, ethical line, and we will have to take you to fantasy court with Andy on that <laughs> one. But um, I think for you know, there are obviously like some strategy-based moves that you can make when you are rebuilding. You know, you can do the Sashi Brown thing of like trading established veterans for draft picks and stuff like that. You know, that's like not a that's like a so, what is it? it's like a soft tank. It's not a hard tank. Like you can't hard tank, I think, in Dynasty, but you can you can like you can rebuild. You can do that type of stuff. Um, I think you know you got to raise some eyebrows at somebody that maybe uh you know benches uh zeke elliott for uh alex collins right i was just about to say i was like alex collins (laughs) bring it back back. god i wish i could be i wish i didn't (laughs) have uh, alex collins on my dynasty team it's killing me right now but uh he's like just burning a hole there and uh, i'm probably gonna have to start him next week tough scene anyways like yeah i think you gotta i think you gotta look at it i think you gotta look at that right like why that's not that's that's probably pushing it as well because there are just so many things you can do uh for and again like nothing is guaranteed i still i still want to maintain that like you know you also don't want to be the person who in order to tank for yourself is giving someone else another win i don't think that's like in the competitive spirit of the whole thing uh that boosts their odds the playoffs and again like Listen, uh, think about drafts several years ago in Dynasty. And I know this is like, obviously, it's just better to have the first pick and blah, 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 blah. But like a couple of years ago in Dynasty, people are at 101 are taking Clyde Edwards Alaire over Jonathan Taylor. And how do you think those people feel feel about throwing that, you know, week 16 matchup right. or something right. like, like that? Uh, so, yeah, those are just all kinds of examples of uh, th- ways that that could go wrong. I think you'd probably just try to play your best lineup and, and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, another sort of ethical debate um, and, and also sort of a strategy one is – how much do you focus on blocking your opponents with the waiver wire, whether with your fab or your waiver priority? And, and the comparison I'll make it to is I play a lot of like German style board games, which tend to have very mm-hmm. dynamic boards or layouts that are very different game to game and turn to turn. So it's sort of like the difference between Monopoly versus like Settlers of Catan is, is a very popular one. In those games, you have to be very adaptable while also c- keeping a close eye on what your opponents are doing. So oftentimes you find yourself in a position where you need to choose, do you, I want to use my turn to make a move that benefits me or blocks my opponent? It's the same idea with the waiver wire sometimes. So even aside from the ethical side of that, that conversation do you think it's an effective strategy to use your priority or fab dollars to try and block somebody else instead of adding a player that you're actually going to use yates i love the example there that you threw out of like settlers of Catan or risk and stuff like that where it's like you it's a strategy like that's part of the game and i think that fantasy football and this aspect of it is part of the game where you're keeping an eye on what's happening around around you. And if you're in those key playoff situations where, and I talked about it with like Samaj P. Ryan, if he becomes available in your waiver wire, like you're you're wanting to add him or whatever, like you're not wanting to battle um, the other manager for Samaj P. Ryan in week 14 or 15, like oh, this is part of it with FAB. And this is what makes uh, the waiver wire a little bit more fun with FAB bidding is you're able to kind of play the game. Do I hold on to my fab for these key weeks and kind of just see what the other managers in my league have? Uh, I know in the sleeper bowl right now, Scott Fish is uh, sitting there with an incredibly solid record somehow. He's sitting there at like, you know, nine and three right now. And uh, he still has like all of his fab. And so I've like recognized that because if I'm I'm in third place now, if I'm battling him 
in the first round or second round of the playoffs, like I know that he has more fab than I do. And so if a key player becomes available, I know that he's probably going to be able to grab that player over me. So this is part of it. This is part of playing the game. And so, yes, I absolutely would be paying attention to what other managers do. And if a key player does become available, I don't need them for that week, but the other player does, I'm 100% picking them up. Matt, if you have a lot of fab left at this point in the season, how do you take advantage of it? Do you try and win little um, you know, bids here and there in the final month, or do you save it for, oh, uh, uh, Marlon Mack is now somebody we all want. I'm going to go in and, and you just sort of take it from everybody. Uh, number one, uh, I would love to be the type of person that has uh, still has their fab. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. One league, I blew it all on Damian Williams. God almighty. I hate myself for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, well, Khalil Herbert was actually the correct answer. Didn't yeah. see that one coming. But anyways, um, yeah, no, for one, lo- would love to be in that position. Number two, yeah, I, do- I think it's totally okay to play because there's a cost-benefit analysis for yourself, right? I mean, if you're doing the tanking lineup thing, you're only doing that to benefit yourself. You're not doing that to, like, take away from other folks or whatever. Um, you're actually going to end up helping other people and in the long run get into the playoffs or whatever. But for players like uh, – you know, you're 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 picking up that that Samaji Pierre and Marlon Mack a little earlier. There's a cost because it costs you a roster spot. It costs you some fab dollars or whatever. So yeah, I think that's totally fine. I think I think you're 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 in the you're in the good graces of the ethical uh, gods doing that one. Yeah, another strategy question here. Would you guys recommend picking up a top quarterback or defense streamer a week or two in advance? I, based on the way we've talked about everything, I'm assuming the answer is going to be yes. Um, or on the other side, would you prefer to just have multiple quality quarterbacks on your bench or, or multiple defenses even on your bench um, to be able to play that matchup game week to week at this point in the season, Matt? Yes, I think if you are, um, you don't have like a Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, guys that you're, you know, you're never going to bench. Um, there's obviously more guys than that out there. Those are not the only examples, but if you are playing the, um, I would put Joe Burrow in this category, put Russell Wilson in this category right now. Like, yeah, there's conceivably a situation where I'd play a a streaming quarterback over those guys. Um, I think you could totally pick up somebody that, that has a really good matchup in week 15, week 16, whatever. Like you can do, you can do that research obviously on your own. Like, and and yeah, I would, I would advocate that. I'd advocate uh, defenses. Like who's playing the jets in week 16, you know, who's, who's playing uh, insert X offense of mess right now i think you can totally make uh those calls again it's just about bench space and everything you want to have some space for these uh the marlin max of the world you also would love to have space for this so it's you're gonna have to make some hard decisions you're gonna have to make some hard cuts there and then that's also a thing too just to mention that as well like keep an eye on waiver run number two in your league. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just about that first one. Like look at who, cause people are going to have, if they're, if they're smart, they're going to be making these tough cuts and everything. Say somebody does cut Kadarius Tony cause they never are going to, to need him shoot. But you might be in a situation where you, you need a Kadarius Tony, like as a potential upside flex in week 14, 15, something like that. Um, that just bring it back. There are be- probably better examples, but just keep that in mind for yourself too, that you want to be monitoring who, uh, and that's a good reason to use, your fab as well monitor who other people are cutting as well yeah yates are you looking far ahead to get some of these matchup based quarterbacks or defenses or or whatever streamer you're looking at absolutely and i think again but it all comes back to what's your bench space like are do you have the ability to be able to roster another quarterback and another defense most likely you don't so you've got to kind of make these 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 uh these decisions here where you got to kind of play this this guessing game like okay do i really want to take this shot with this defense or do i want to hold on to this high-end insurance policy running back or do i cut what my fifth wide receiver and just roll with four of them you know like those kind of decisions you have to make those for yourself but yeah it all it all comes down to bench space but yes you should be looking a week ahead two weeks ahead as far as once you get into the fantasy playoffs as far as those defenses because those do become very very valuable yeah, and, and would you say, Kyle, Kyle, sorry to, to jump in fine. here. Would you say it's, 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 I would say it's probably easier to, to project a quarterback, right? Like if you've got, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Burrow, uh, Kirk Cousins level of guys where you could conceivably bench somebody, I feel more comfortable stashing someone if they've got a rough week 16 matchup. I feel more comfortable doing that as I think defense is obviously there's some volatility there. Like I'd love to stash whoever is playing the Jags in week 16, the Jets are playing the Jags in week 16. Like, am I really, do I really want to drop a potential useful bench player or uh, an upside player? Like, I think you kind of have to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, If you are kind of doing the streaming situation at defense and quarterback, 
I'd yep. probably feel more secure going for the the streaming level quarterback as opposed to the streaming level defense, just because defense can be more volatile. And like, I'm confident that most of the quarterbacks can give me replacement level value. Defenses can be obviously a little more volatile uh, because it's so sack and turnover based. So I just think that's also something to keep in mind. You probably can't do both. You got to pick one right. or the other. And I'd probably pick quarterback over. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that's a good distinction to make is like, it's the quarterback that I would give the edge to because also too defenses are experiencing a lot of turnover. Like we got to the point where we completely ri had written off Miami, the mm, Dolphins yeah. DST and the chiefs defense. And now those are two, like we talked about them on the waiver wire podcast. Like these are two defenses that are performing very, very well recently so i think they've now started to figure it out and again it all comes down to like how far out are you looking ahead like yeah. two weeks out for a defense that's a little bit risky here but with the quarterback we at least can feel comfortable like they're gonna stay healthy for the most part they uh you know and we can predict those kind of matchups at this point we have enough data now to look back on with 12 weeks 12 games in the book to be able to say okay i know that this defense is not a defense that i'm scared off of playing a quarterback against that's a good point yeah, and it's also like it should be mentioned that if you are, you know, eleven and one or, or whatever the math at whatever you would be at this point in the season where you're in a clear first place situation, then it's a lot easier to do this. If you are in that that you know middle ground uh, that most people seem to be in, that it is harder. You sort of have to. I feel like with a lot of our strategy questions, it's you know balancing short term versus long term. Yeah. It's like the old um, Seinfeld uh, stand-up line where he's at the pharmacy and he's looking at the different like uh, you know pain medications and one of them's quick acting but this one's long lasting. When do I need to feel good now or later? When do you need help on your fantasy <laughs> yeah. team right now or in a couple of weeks when you can right. actually you know win a championship? So it, it is sort of hard to balance that. Does the does the extra week of the season this year change any of these strategies for you guys, Matt? No, I mean I think it just. You're just mostly extending things further. I think it's it's going to be – the extra week will be interesting as we – we talked about this a little bit earlier, but how are teams going to handle that? Like, uh, I mean, we – I feel like we end up overrating the teams are going to bench their starters thing anyways, uh, and we'll see how they handle it this, this year. I, I don't think that – you know, there's just been so many injuries. It's hard to say, anyways. But I kind of felt like maybe, maybe guys will get like several weeks of rest when they might have, you know, for for contending teams. But the fact that we haven't seen that many teams that are just like, oh, we're the you know mid 2000s Patriots or mid you know Peyton Manning Colts. We're like, we know we're going to the playoffs. We can start resting guys early. All that stuff. We haven't seen number one. We haven't seen that many teams, and I just don't know that we haven't seen. Uh, we've seen a lot of teams like kind of take that aggressive approach to resting players in the middle of the season that was like a theory i had that it just really hasn't kind of come to pass and then there's the like how are they going to handle it at the end of the season but in terms of all these stash decisions i think no you're just you're looking ahead the same amount it's just another extra week before we move on to the mailbag i do want to ask each of you and yates i'll start with you just for one piece of strategy advice that we haven't touched on yet today something that you like to do the way you approach december football that maybe our listeners haven't thought of Oh man, um, I really don't know if there's anything that comes to like the top of my mind. Um, I think it's just going to be one of these things like you are playing week to week at this point. You know, like it is completely just the long term, like rest of season outlook for players. Like this is the point where it now shifts, where you're moving from, okay, I'm trying to balance this out from a rest of season outlook. Like now trade, trade deadlines are done. We're now moving into we are week to week and you are just simply looking to win this next matchup and that is really it so yeah i think that otherwise nothing really comes to the top of my head matt yeah i feel like we've hit on most of it uh the week to week aspect i think i think is huge that kyle mentioned i, I would also say like now more than ever i think this is true every single week but especially now consider how players if you're making that flex decision consider how they fit in with the rest of your roster construction right like wide receiver i think is the easiest way to talk about it when because you know that some i mean shoot everybody's volatile at wide receiver but you know some guys that are higher floor than others if you want to stick a uh you know volatile player in your flex consider whether your other two starting wide receivers are um, Tyler Lockett who can be more volatile because he plays with Russell Wilson or some of these other guys you know before you're making that decision so I think it's like a general season-long strategy I have but I think it's especially true here we're gonna run through a couple of mailbag questions here we're gonna keep these pretty quick and short so we don't need to go too long on any of them at Roji's point asks 
what are we doing with Cam Newton right now? Obviously, a guy that, especially in Superflex leagues, seemed like he might be a pretty nice pickup. And then last week, uh, very much not the case. So, Yates, what are you doing with Newton right now? I think in let's take it from the perspective of super flex leagues, because I think in one quarterback leagues, there are other options you can yeah. pivot to. Like you can just move on, especially with the bye week. Like you're not holding on to Cam Newton yeah. through his bye week. So I think in super flex, I do think that he's at least worth holding on to. Like, I think that what we saw with five for what five for 21, like that <laughs> is the absolute low point. Uh, I pray I don't to think God I've that ever seen that I, before. That might be it's, a low point for any quarterback ever. <laughs> I, there was a someone put out a stat that it's like one of the the bottom two performances all time. Like it's it. it's terrible. So, um, but I do think that with Newton, uh, they are going to be at least coming out of their bye week and adjusting to life without Christian McCaffrey. They're going to be saying, okay, what can we do now to make life easy on Cam Newton without CMC in the lineup? So. I think that we are not going to see that low point. I do think that he will still have value because of his rushing ability in super flex league. So I'm still holding on to him because of the value of quarterback there. But otherwise, in one quarterback leagues, yeah, just simply move on. Matt, I'll ask you um, another question on a quarterback. At Fast Fred 13 asked us, is Taysom Hill a top 15 quarterback rest of season in fantasy? And you could say, you know, I could spin this question into, is he startable in one quarterback leagues uh, if he is the starting guy for the Saints going for the rest of the season, given that rushing upside? Uh, my answer to the second question is probably no. I feel like there, you probably have a better option in one quarterback leagues, uh, but he is someone that you'd consider, right? I kind of want to see what he looks like in this version of the Saints offense uh, before I really make that decision because, man, you know, last year at least he had Michael Thomas for most of the, for some of those games where he was involved in. You know, it is rough. I mean, the same, I talked about Washington and the preseason boys earlier. Like, it is the preseason boys up there right. in that scene. Like, that, with, especially with that Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram on, thir- on Thursday, I'm like, who are these guys? You know, like, I mean, obviously, no, no, they are, but it is what it is. Like, it's a tough offense right now. So um, I don't and I'd probably take the under on QB 15 rest of season. But listen, we know that rushing upside is is a cheat code. That's why Cam Newton is still a viable guy, even despite like at least he got he should have had negative points. But at least he rushed right. that touchdown the in earlier. Touchdown right? saved me. I, I started him in a few spots and yeah. that at least saved me. <laughs> Yeah, so we know that rushing can be that cheat code, and obviously Taysom Hill is going to do a little bit of that, but how often are they going to be getting into the red zone uh, with this version of this offense? It's it's fair to, to question. Last mailbag question here. At Texas Habs fan asks, what do I do with myself now that I didn't make one playoffs in any of my leagues this year? First time in 20 years. And I wanted to ask this question because what, what do you do in the last month of the season if you are completely out of the race? It's not a dynasty format. Um, you know, just how do you approach those last few weeks? What what makes it so fun for you? Do you even stay engaged or do you completely tune out? What do you guys do in this scenario? Yates, I'll start with you. Uh, to uh, what what was your TikTok after uh, Derrick Henry went down? Is <laughs> like now is the time to get really, really into fantasy into basketball <laughs> because your season is over. Yeah. Uh, obviously, no, like basketball season's underway. So, but no, I think. There's there are still things that you can can pivot to like I will still set my lineups in in uh, my my leagues that I'm in like I'll still make sure to field those um, but I think you can now turn to like DFS like there's DFS that you can turn to and then as we move into the NFL playoffs like that's still something that you can can definitely get interested in um, so yeah there's still things to feed that kind of like hunger that you have for fantasy football you're obviously still listening to this podcast to hear that question so I think that's something now where yes still field your lineups don't just completely ghost but I do think that there are other alternatives that you can turn to. Matt, what about you? And you will get bonus points if you find a way to work in another one of my viral TikToks. <laughs> Don't know that I'll be able to do that, but uh, <laughs> there's definitely, like Kyle said, there's daily fantasy. You know, if, if sports betting is legal in your state, like get in on some prop betting action. Like there, there's still plenty of ways to stay engaged, right? There's plenty of ways to fuel that sickness. But for your redraft leagues, don't. Don't give up. Be the berserker, right? Like, what's better? Obviously, what's better? Winning the fantasy championship is the best <laughs> thing, right? Like, that's better. But what's better than, you know, being able to, like, look at your friend and be like, hey, 
I'm the reason you're out of the playoffs. Like I go. was that, you know, one in whatever team. I stunk all year. And in week 15, I boot or, you know, whatever is your first week before your playoffs. I booted you out of a playoff spot. At least you have that. So be, be the, the berserker villain. team. Be the be villain. The, yes. Be the villain. Um, obviously, once the playoffs start, like maybe you can win your little consolation bracket. This is why there are there should be incentives to not get in last place and everything like that. So, um, yeah, hopefully you have some of those. But, yeah, be the berserker berserker team that like knocks a knocks a playoff contender out like the Washington football team I think that's what Washington football team is probably going to be this year like once they get their guys back they're probably not going to the playoffs but they Te- can mess up they're some... in the playoffs right now I know, the I know. what seat. a weird what a weird year what a weird <laughs> year. But, as, uh... <laughs> as a Baltimore Orioles fan I'm very used to playing the spoiler role so I, I fully you support go. that uh, I think that's a, a fun way to go out in the season before we go out on this episode uh, you know I have to get in another pop culture question Yates, last week I did put you on the spot and you kind of botched it with your three favorite sitcom characters of all time. You did admit to me later that you botched it, so I'm not just throwing you under the bus there. This week I will make it a little easier for you easier for you, and just ask for your number one favorite holiday episode of television of all time. Can be any show, any genre, any holiday, but I want your on-the-spot pick. The first one that comes to mind is Friends and the Holiday Armadillo. Oh. Like that's the first one that comes to mind. So I I don't know if I would say that's like my favorite favorite, but uh, it's the first one that comes to mind. That one's a classic. I saw someone did like a viral video. They got like a, you know, the holiday armadillo costume and did like a TikTok dance and stuff like that. I thought that was fantastic. So that's the first one that comes to mind. Matt, I don't know how much TV you watch, but if you have a favorite pick, I'd love to get yours too. Oh, uh, any of like, I would say the... (laughs) The Benihana Christmas episode of The Office is like one of my all time favorites, but it's close with with Moroccan Christmas. Also a great uh, The Office TV episode uh, for for Christmas. Those are their Christmas episodes are usually pretty golden. So I'll go there. Yeah, I I wanted to make Yates happy and say the Halloween heist episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which I think are are pretty fantastic uh, throughout the seasons. I'm not even sure which one would be my favorite. They're all really good. But if I'm being honest, instead of making Yates happy, I will have to make Dan Harris happy and pick Festivus in, from Seinfeld nice, because yeah. it's just, I, I have Classic. a Festivus poll in my parents' basement somewhere. We used to do <laughs> the feats of strength and the airing of grievances. We'd have parties for like five or six straight years in high school and college. It was always a great time. So, uh, you know, that, that's it's an iconic episode. It's, just, it's the episode of Seinfeld I've watched the most times. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fantastic in every possible way. Thank you guys for both indulging me there, and thank you both for a fantastic episode. I'm certainly hoping that everyone listening comes away just – a little bit smarter today and has some good strategy advice for the end of the season and finishing strong. Please, everybody, remember all the awesome opportunities we mentioned, including Prediction Strike, Organifi, and Ultimate Fan. And most of all, thank you, the fans, for listening. For Yates and Matt, I'm Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.